Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Jacobin Talks. My name is Micah Utrecht. I'm the deputy editor of Jacobin. And we'll give everybody a second to get on uh, the broadcast. Uh, as folks probably know, we have been doing this political education series on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as through Facebook since the pandemic uh, began, usually giving a speaker about half an hour to lay out an argument and then half hour worth of discussion with uh, the moderator as well as uh, you, the watcher and listener at home. So please chime in on the chat on YouTube and on Facebook as uh, the conversation goes on. And please do share and uh, like and subscribe to our stream. Like uh, this video and subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. This is how we uh, get our uh, videos in front of people's faces. Uh, and that is a particularly important task in the uh, fetid swamp of uh, mostly uh, right-wing political content that is uh, YouTube. We're trying to, uh, to challenge the right's hegemony on this platform. So please like and uh, subscribe. Uh, before we get into today's show, we can go into what we've got uh, coming up for the rest of the week. So on Wednesday, we will have Matt McManus and Jackman columnist Ben Burgess in uh, discussion. Now, I'm assured that this is a, a, a like a sober and serious uh, analysis of uh, Jordan Peterson and his ideas and trying to you know locate uh, why he is uh, popular and how we as the left can uh, can can push back against the kind of ideas that he's putting out there. But I have a feeling that that won't do very well on YouTube. So let me just say, we're going to talk about why Jordan Peterson is always wrong. We are going to destroy him. We are going to put just shred him, to leave him in tiny little pieces. I think that's that tends to be what gets the most, uh, <laughs> most clicks on YouTube. So I'm just going to say that that's what's going to go on on Wednesday with Matt McManus and Ben Burgess. And then on Friday, we have a talk with Paul Heidemann on why you should be a Marxist, a uh, perpetual discussion on, on the left. Uh, and uh, both of those talks on Wednesday and Friday are at 6 p.m. Eastern. And then on Saturday, we have our show Weekends, hosted by Nando Avila and Anna Kasparian, with uh, guest Lee Phillips uh, talking about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the free market systems, total inability to adequately respond to it, uh, as well as I'm sure a number of other topics. So that is on Saturday at 1 p.m. And I should mention that uh, I'm coming to you from Chicago where there's some extreme weather warning <laughs> happening right now. So you may hear some uh, some uh, thunder and maybe other stuff in the, in the background. Hopefully you won't witness my you know windows in my apartment getting uh, blown out or something. But uh, today we are joined by Jacobin contributing editor Hillary Goodfriend. Hillary is a contributing editor of Jacobin, the editorial board member of NACLA. And let me just pause for a minute to say that NACLA is a magazine that has, um, in Hillary, maybe you can say more about it if you'd like. Uh, it, it's a magazine that has roots in the new left uh, that is focused on Latin America and is provides some of the, the, the best coverage you'll get on Latin America uh, anywhere in, in the English language. Uh, so uh, if, if you like Jacobin and if you uh, are interested in this talk we're going to do today, you should definitely be reading uh, NACLA on a regular basis. As I said, uh, Hillary is an editorial board member there. She's also a doctoral student in Latin American studies at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México in Mexico City. And she will be talking today about the U.S.'s uh, history of intervention in Central America uh, with, the, with the focus on the 19. 80s. And I'll say before you start, Hillary, that you already know this, but this is a, a subject that is a pretty near and dear to my heart because I somehow, despite being extremely Protestant, went to two Catholic colleges. And at both of those colleges, we uh, there, there's a big emphasis on things like the uh, School of the Americas, the annual protest that happened in Fort Benning, Georgia, and an emphasis on the history of, for example, the uh, murder of uh, the Jesuit priests, as well as their housekeeper and her daughter that you wrote about uh, for Jacobin. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's a big emphasis on liberation theology and U.S. repression of 
of the rise of liberation theology, especially in Latin America. There's an article you can read on the Jackman website that Hillary wrote on the anniversary of the murder of these priests at the, the UCA in uh, San Salvador, El Salvador. And uh, uh, it was a real eye opener for me in terms of what, you know, understanding on a very intimate level what American imperialism uh, looked like, even at the, the very end of the Cold War. There was sort of like no uh, no bottom to the the, the depths that, that the uh, that the U.S. would stoop to in terms of the kinds of uh, human rights abuses, and of course, I'm sure you're going to talk about it. I mean, not just the murder of these six priests, but the murder of an entire village in, in uh, El Mosote in El Salvador, and all of these examples all throughout uh, Central America are, really give us some insight into uh, the 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 real nitty gritty details of the, the horrors that, that that go are along with that sort of anodyne sounding term, uh, U.S. imperialism. So grateful to have you uh, talking about this today. Hillary's going to speak for about a half an hour, and then we will take your questions. So again, uh, please do uh, give uh, questions and comments in the chats. And with that, I will turn it over to Hillary. All right. Thank you so much, Micah. Uh, hope you stay safe while I'm speaking over here. Um, yeah, you know, my my personal radicalization has a lot to do with uh, visiting El Salvador uh, and learning as a teenager about uh, this history. So I'm excited to have the chance to talk about it. Um, you know, this history of U.S. intervention in Central America in the 80s, and I think the, the Contra War in Nicaragua in particular, it's important for a lot of reasons, uh, the most glaring of which is maybe, you know, its role in creating the conditions for the current crises that we see today of forced migration, gang violence, uh, the criminalization of migrants. But Central America in the 80s is an important historical site in its own right uh, for revolutionary struggle, international solidarity, uh, and some of the most, you know, heinous and depraved imperialist violence, as Micah mentioned. U.S. policy there also uh, sort of created a blueprint for more recent interventions, which I'll, I'll discuss in the end. So I'm going to focus mostly on Nicaragua as well as El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala. Um, this is in order to highlight the role of U.S. imperialism in the conflicts there. I should stress, though, that, you know, when we talk about Central America, we're also talking about Belize, we're talking about Costa Rica and Panama. Um, so a little bit to situate the national liberation struggles in Central America for context. Central America has been locked into this sort of classic relationship of what Latin American critics theorize as dependency, which is the ongoing reproduction of its subordination to the imperialist economies ever since its insertion in the global capitalist market as independent nations in the 1800s. So the countries of Central America exported primary goods, so specifically uh, coffee and bananas, to U.S. markets, and that resulted in a huge concentration of land in the hands of a few oligarchic families or uh, foreign corporations and the vast dispossession and immiseration of the indigenous majorities. All of this under uh, repressive military dictatorships uh, under the U.S. wing. Um, there were brief democratic openings in the 1940s uh, in which student organizing and uh, the labor movement were especially important. And these were met with a vicious anti-communist backlash with, I guess, the notable exception of Costa Rica um, that really set the tone for the rest of the century. So the 1954 CIA directed coup in Guatemala against uh, democratically elected president Jacobo Arbenz is kind of the key event of this time period. Um, but the Cuban revolution in 1959 becomes another turning point because it established a successful insurgency model for the region. Um, and despite half-hearted efforts by uh, President Kennedy's Alliance for Progress in the 1960s to sort of implement minimal social reforms and stave off revolution, U.S. policy always prioritized security over anything like development. Um, and Stuart Schrader has a nice discussion of this in his new book on counterinsurgency policing. Um, which is why the Alliance for Progress also entailed things like founding civilian militias uh, that soon basically became paramilitary death squads uh, acting against perceived subversives in the region, including those people who were, you know, 
fighting for the same minimum democratic reforms that the United States claimed to support. So on the ground, these democratic openings closed and nonviolent efforts for democratization or redistribution were met with increasingly homicidal violence by these regimes that were armed, trained, and funded by the, by the United States. So in the 70s, you start seeing the formation of insurgent political military organizations. Um, in Nicaragua, the Sandinista National Liberation Front, or FSLN, becomes sort of the next big milestone. Um, in 1979, they overthrow the Somoza dictatorship uh, and actually begin the construction of something like a democratic socialist republic, you know, with massive social investment and a mixed redistributive economy in Nicaragua. Uh, shortly thereafter, in October of 1980, the five principal rebel uh, groups in El Salvador united to form the Farabundo Martí National Liberation Front. And the refrain was, uh, si Nicaragua venció, El Salvador vencerá, which is like, if Nicaragua triumphed, then El Salvador will as well. Um, the FMLN in El Salvador had up to 10,000 rebel soldiers in its ranks at its height. And in Guatemala, there was there are actually different degrees of this kind of clandestine organizing ever since the coup. But in 1982, the Guatemalan National Revolutionary Unity forms. Um, Honduras never really got its own insurgent army together for a couple of reasons. There was mild land reform in the 70s that um, kind of achieved what other regional elites couldn't really bring themselves to do. It helps that it's a big country, it's sparsely populated, although they did expel 300,000 Salvadorans in the process. Um, but also, and importantly, in 1954, Honduras had signed over the whole country to the U.S. military. So this military agreement between the two countries that year basically rendered the whole uh, territory of Honduras into a U.S. military satellite, which is why Honduras was used as a staging ground for the CIA coup in Guatemala in 54, but also later, after the Sandinista victory, as the staging ground for the Contra War. It's worth noting as well that these insurgencies, uh, they tried to sort of place themselves as the heirs to a long anti-imperialist and revolutionary history in Central America. So the FSLN is named for Augusto Sandino, who fought the US occupation of Nicaragua in the 20s and 30s. Uh, the FMLN is named for Farabundo Martí, who founded the Salvadoran Communist Party and actually fought with Sandino prior to helping lead a fail insur failed insurrection in El Salvador in 1932. Um, these guerrilla armies had determined that revolutionary struggle was the only viable path to achieve perhaps socialist revolution, but even basic survival for the dispossessed majorities. And this, this calculation was quickly confirmed by the Nicaraguan Revolution of 79, but also by the increasing repression. So in El Salvador alone, there's the 1975 massacre of university students, uh, the 1977 assassination of priest Rutilio Grande, uh, the assassination of Archbishop Romero, who's now a saint, um, the rape and murder of four US nuns and lay missionaries that same year, and the 1981 massacre of nearly a thousand, mostly children um, at El Mozote that Micah alluded to. Um, and the basis for these movements were, were really diverse, uh, you know, and they brought together elements of both the old and new left. Um, campesinos, you know, rural peasants formed a broad base. Uh, there was a lot of radical student leadership and of course labor unionists, but very importantly, like Micah mentioned, uh, is the religious component, you know, Christian based communities and clergies who are grounded in this radical Catholic doctrine of liberation theology is absolutely foundational to these movements. Um, you know, I mentioned a lot of assassinated religious folks in El Salvador. Um, in Nicaragua, Ernesto Cardenal is one of the great figures of the revolution. Um, he was a priest and a poet. Uh, he was famously reprimanded, and here's the image of uh, Pope John Paul II, but he was later rehabilitated by Pope Francis. And he served as the Sandinista Minister of Culture. And his brother, who was a Jesuit priest, was the Minister of Education. So. Um, the U.S., uh, well, I should say the Cold War in Central America was, was extremely hot, right? I mean, U.S. forces waged a genocidal anti-communist crusade uh, throughout especially the 70s and 80s. Um, and those wars left hundreds of thousands of people dead, 
uh, tens of thousands disappeared and millions more displaced. And I think there's really no question that it was US intervention that prevented an otherwise likely FMLN victory in El Salvador and forced the eventual electoral defeat of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. So in El Salvador, Archbishop Romero sent President Jimmy Carter a letter shortly before his murder, pleading that he cut off military aid to the regime and he got no response. Uh, during the height of the Civil War, which formerly lasted from 1980 to 1992, the Reagan administration was sending more than a million dollars a day to the Salvadoran government. Um, and they had dozens of military advisors on the ground uh, who definitely engaged in combat. In addition to the, you know, the massacres and assassinations I mentioned, the regime, uh, their atrocities included the system, systematic use of paramilitary death squads, uh, sexual violence and torture, techniques that were taught most famously at the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, but also by US trainers and by people trained by the US throughout the region. So Argentina actually played a really big role in training Central American troops and sort of overseeing the counterinsurgency. Um, the deployment of death squads was so sophisticated that when a lot of these neocon veterans of the Central America Wars were resurrected to lead the invasion of Iraq, that tactic became known as the Salvador option. Um, so the 1993 UN Truth Commission in El Salvador estimated that the war left at least 75,000 people dead, uh, 10,000 disappeared, and it attributed at least 85% of that violence to the US backed security forces uh, and only 5% to the FMLN. In Guatemala, the scorched earth campaign that was waged against uh, rural Mayan communities in the Ixil region in the early 80s under General Efraín Ríos Montt, who was this fanatical evangelical Christian, it was deemed a genocide. Um, and Reagan in 1982 called Ríos Montt a man of great personal integrity. He said he was getting a bum rap on human rights. Um, you know, about 100,000 Mayan peasants were murdered by the government of Guatemala between 1981 and 1983 alone. Um, but in fact, the targeting of indigenous populations as subversive by the government was employed since the 60s. Like El Salvador, the war in Guatemala was formally brought to a close by UN mediated negotiations, in this case in 1996. By then, over 200,000 people had been killed, 40,000 disappeared. 83% um, of identified victims were of Mayan descent and the US backed government was found responsible for at least 93% of that violence. Um, in the case of Honduras, the country was known as the USS Honduras because of the you know, innumerable military bases in its territory. Um, and US ambassador under Reagan, John Negro Ponte, who's one of these Cold War zombies you know, that gets revived by every Republican administration, he was referred to as the proconsul. Honduras housed the US Regional Military Training Center at a, at a base in the Bahuaguan region. And with no serious uh, insurgency of its own, uh, Honduras served as the staging ground for military operations in the region, most notably uh, for the Contra War against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. So the US mission to overthrow the successful Sandinista revolution led to one of the US's greatest scandals, which is the Iran-Contra affair. The FSLN overthrew Somoza in 1979 and Reagan takes office in 1981. And he immediately uh, starts to actively destabilize the Sandinista government. Um, he authorizes the CIA to create a mercenary army, which is recruited largely out of former Nicaraguan National Guardsmen, a National Guard, which I should say a few decades earlier was actually founded by the United States itself. Um, so Congress uh, began to put limits on US funding for covert military action against the Nicaraguan government. And uh, they outlawed it entirely by 1984. So the Reagan administration starts looking for illicit covert means you know, to circumvent Congress and, uh, and hide their activities from the press and the public. Uh, top administration officials crafted these elaborate conspiracies to purchase and smuggle arms and equipment to these so-called contra or counter-revolutionary paramilitary fighters uh, who are based in Honduras. Um, and these, uh, this army attacked public schools and clinics, uh, cooperatives, infrastructure. They massacred civilians and foreign aid workers and mutilated bodies. They even mined the Nicaraguan harbors in 1983 with the CIA. Um, 
Reagan called the Contras the moral equivalent of our founding fathers. So even for folks familiar with the seedy underbelly of US imperialist violence, the Iran-Contra stuff really strains credulity. Um, so I'm gonna give a couple highlights of uh, some of what was involved in maintaining this secret illegal paramilitary war. Um, Operation Black Eagle uh, was a Contra supply plot that was run by uh, CIA Director William Casey together with then Vice President George H.W. Bush and his National Security Advisor Donald Gregg, along with Felix Rodriguez. Rodriguez is a Cuban exile. He was a Bay of Pigs veteran who served in Vietnam with Gregg, and he's probably most famous for his part in the capture and execution of Che Guevara in, in Bolivia. Um, he's also implicated in the 1985 kidnapping, torture, and murder of DEA agent Kiki Camarena, who folks might know from the Narco series uh, in Mexico, where Rodriguez was selling drugs for the Guadalajara cartel and using profits to buy weapons and equipment for the Contras. And the story is that Camarena discovered the U.S. role in the operation and they ordered his murder and then blamed it on cartel leader Caro Quintero. Anyway, uh, the Operation Black Eagle used airfields in El Salvador and in Panama to fly supplies into the Contras with help from the, the Mossad, the Israelis. Uh, Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega collaborated in exchange for the use of these CIA planes to fly cocaine and marijuana into the United States on behalf of the Medellin cartel. Of course, the George H.W. Bush administration later invaded Panama and deposed Noriega in 1989 once the convenience of that relationship was exhausted. Um, another plot that was run this time out of the Ilopango Air Base in El Salvador and overseen by Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, who's a top aide on Reagan's National Security Council, was broadly referred to as the Enterprise. Um, Felix Rodriguez was joined on the ground there by another Cuban exile uh, and famous anti-communist terrorist, Luis Posada Carriles, who's most famous for blowing up Cubana Flight 455 in 1976, he killed 73 people. Um, but he's also implicated in the assassination of former Allende foreign minister of Chile, Orlando Letelier in Washington DC that same year. Um, he escaped, Posada Carriles, escaped prison in Venezuela and was flown immediately to El Salvador in 1985, uh, where he joined this Contra supply operation. Uh, Rodriguez and the pilots were bringing hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash in from the United States to buy fuel from the head of the Salvadoran Air Force. And this was fuel that had been donated by the United States for the war against the FMLN. Uh, and their planes were provided by the Miami-based CIA front company, uh, Southern Air Transport. So this plot finally blows up in October of 1986, October 5th. Uh, after one of the CIA supply planes was shot down over Nicaragua and the Sandinistas captured the surviving pilot, Eugene Hassenbus. And it turned out that the funds for this operation had come from illegal weapons sales to Iran, which were overseen by North with Israeli intermediaries. And so after a massive cover up and lies, destruction of evidence, 14 Reagan officials were indicted uh, 11 convicted, and some of these convictions were vacated. The rest were pardoned in the last days of the George H.W. Bush administration. So contra destabilization continued until the Sandinistas' electoral defeat in 1990, which ushered in a long period of right-wing neoliberal restructuring. So the war was successful, not in militarily defeating the Sandinistas, but by wearing them down, you know, forcing the government to divert funding from social investments, uh, to stave off the mercenaries, and I think generally exhausting the population. By the decades closed, that war had claimed more than 30,000 civilian lives. So this is a remarkable period, not only because of this genuine revolutionary struggle in Central America, you know, even as the rest of the region is falling to this full IMF imposed Chilean style neoliberalism, but also because of the internationalist response, especially in the United States itself. As the US left is entering, you know, one of its darkest decades, Central American exiles organized people in the United States to provide sanctuary and relief for refugees to oppose US intervention uh, and support for the military regimes and counter-revolutionary struggles. 
um, and even to provide material support uh, for these leftist insurgencies. And these movements, which were sometimes referred to as the Central America Solidarity Movement or the Central America Peace Movement uh, and the Sanctuary Movement, they really encompassed a, a diverse spectrum of, of groups and tactics. Um, you know, influenced by the Venceremos Brigades to revolutionary Cuba in the 60s, activists organized delegations to Sandinista Nicaragua to work on, on coffee harvests or deliver other aid and services. Uh, groups visited indigenous communities facing state violence in Guatemala. They traveled to uh, liberated guerrilla held territory in El Salvador and also to Salvadoran refugee camps in Honduras, gathering testimonies on the depredations of US foreign policy. Um, in the United States, they engaged in mass acts of civil disobedience. People risked their lives in direct actions to stop arms shipments. Uh, they waged national political campaigns and provided aid and services for asylum seekers. And these groups faced widespread uh, government persecution, including jail time for undocumented migrants, but also covert FBI harassment and infiltration. So uh, to start bringing things to a close here, Central America has been this imperial laboratory. Greg Grand and the historian called it Empire's Workshop, first for counterinsurgency warfare in the 80s, and then for radical neoliberal economic restructuring in the 90s and well into the present. You know, post coup Honduras is basically ground zero for this right wing resurgence that has swept through Latin America and rolled back the so called pink tide progressive governments, you know, most recently deposing Evo Morales in Bolivia. It's also been a site of important and lasting internationalism, and not just from the US. Honduran and Nicaraguan uh, guerrilleros joined the FMLN and the Sandinistas, um, or rather the Sandinistas uh, in turn provided a haven for Salvadoran fighters and their families. Um, Chileans and Argentinians and Europeans joined these insurgencies. Uh, and to this day, communities and parishes across, parishes across the U.S. keep up sister relationships with communities in the region um, and grassroots organizations like the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, School of the Americas Watch, and Witness for Peace continue to link struggles across borders and fight U.S. imperialism. Um, the legacies of the, the horrors wrought by U.S. policies in Central America confront us every day. Uh, working class Central Americans risk their lives uh, to flee the poverty and violence generated by these decades of U.S. military intervention, but also, of course, U.S.-backed neoliberal reforms of privatization and austerity and free trade, um, as well as climate change. And tens of thousands of people are stranded right now in Mexico, uh, being denied their right to seek asylum in the U.S., uh, and millions face racialized criminalization and exploitation within U.S. borders. At the same time, the ghouls of Reagan's New Right Coalition, you know, they brought together evangelical Christians and free market fundamentalists and nationalists, they're still around. John Bolton, Elliot Abrams, Negro Ponte, Otto Reich, even Oliver North, their, their equation of U.S. capitalist accumulation with global freedom and their reflexive recourse to covert, illegal, and unilateral action, and their you know, general disdain for human life, it's a huge part of US foreign policy today. Uh, most clearly on display, I'd say, in the recent misadventures in Venezuela. Um, so Grandin's thesis is that Central America is this arena in which the neocons rehabilitated US hard power as a response to this demoralizing defeat in Vietnam uh, and the deep economic recession. So reasserting US military prowess and this ideological claim to a moral authority uh, that basically led us straight into the first Gulf War and eventually into Iraq. Um, I think that's right. And you know we can see what Roberto Lovato calls these circuits of counterinsurgency in anti-gang and anti-migrant policing on both sides of the border today. Um, I think probably the most sinister expression of this is the training of border patrol agents at the School of the Americas uh, and their deployment to repress the movement for black lives and anti-fascist protesters uh, in Portland and elsewhere. So um, yeah, I can leave it there and maybe we can pick up on some of that in the questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Hillary. So 
Uh, again, please do chime in in the comment section if you have questions for Hillary. I have a bunch of them that we'll start with. Uh, so first, I guess you you talked about some of the specific uh, countries in question. You talked about Guatemala and El Salvador and Nicaragua. I guess a big picture in the region, what was the U.S. aim? If, well, I, I, actually, I'll ask you an even bigger question. Throughout the 20th century in the, in the period that led up to what you were just talking about with U.S. intervention in the 80s. And what was the U.S. aiming to establish the region as? Like, what was the what did the U.S. want Central America to be? Uh, and and why was this kind of military intervention seen as such a central task for uh, the U.S. to undertake? I mean, why? You know, I mean, obviously, there's like you know, domino theory or whatever. But like, what what were the actual reasons why? The U.S. felt it was it was so crucial for them to intervene in all of these different sure. countries. Sure, I mean, I think you know a lot of the early 20th century is about the ass assertion of U.S. imperial hegemony in Central America. Um, you know, it, throughout the 1800s, you know, as the Central American nation states are sort of consolidating their independence, you know, they had formed a, a federation that falls apart. Um, there's uh, there's sort of imperial bickering, you know. They they get their uh, hegem they get their independence from Spain, but there's a lot of British presence, obviously, in the region. Uh, there was actually uh, prior to that a bunch of a lot of German presence in the region as well. And so, as the United States emerges from, especially the Second World War, as this you know affirmed uh, neoliberal hegemon. Um, what they're hoping to do is uh, ensure access to Central America, um, primarily to its um, primary resources, right? You know, uh, basically using them as resource colonies uh, for mining, but also for the production of things like coffee, um, like bananas, um, and ensuring that, you know, that whole system, that plantation kind of economy for export system is, is can only be maintained with really, really, really cheap labor, right? Um, which in turn can only be sustained uh, by incredibly anti-democratic and repressive governments. Um, so the the work of the United States throughout much of, of the last century is just to sort of ensure that they can have unimpeded access to, to Central American, you know, land and, and labor, right, resources, um, because any minimal effort to, to democratize um, or redistribute resources in those countries ultimately threatens uh, U.S. interests. Um, and then, of course, in the Cold War, it does become this ideological struggle. I mean, that's so there's the political economy of it, you know, but there's, there's this sense that um, any any challenge to U.S. capitalist accumulation in the region um, is sort of uh, adding to the Soviet, you know, bloc, or at the very least, anything like the non-aligned movement, you know, which which challenges U.S. political domination, um, and you know that ideological perspective was was such that uh you know any any kind of democratization basically looks like communism of course a lot of it was communism um but yeah that's something else the uh walter the historian walter lefebvre wrote a book years ago called inevitable revolutions yeah. where he argued that the revolutions that kicked off in central america were inevitable precisely because in the lead up to the 70s and 80s, the US worked so hard to undermine any attempts at even basic liberal reforms you know, or, or basic um, land reform or redistribution or anything like that, that, that it was the US intervention over and over and the propping up of these brutal dictators and the, the propping up of these uh, regimes that as you mentioned, you know, were, were premised on, on uh, cheap, uh, Central American labor and then resource extraction. Uh, that 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 is what led to uh, the you know the guerrilla warfare uh, by the Salvadorans or the or the Sandinistas or that 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 at least is part of uh, the story. Do you think that is an accurate? Yeah, uh, I mean it's, it's a great book. I I think it is true. Although you know you don't want to um, downplay the role of Central American elites 
in, uh, you know, they were happy uh, to to do the repressing. Um, I think I think the the history shows that those insurrections and revolutions would would have probably happened regardless of the U.S. role. Um, I think what we can say is that they probably would have been successful were it not for the U.S. role in suppressing them. Talk about what it was like to be in a country like El Salvador in the 80s. I mean, uh, I think a lot about myself. I am a editor of a socialist magazine. You're a leftist graduate student who contributes to uh, leftist magazines and, you know, emphasizes, uh, you know, international solidarity. And, and we're, I mean, we're just, we're leftists. We're, we're, you know, active activist leftists. And my read, or I don't, this isn't particularly a groundbreaking analysis, but it seemed pretty clear to me that if I were myself dropped in the middle of El Salvador in the 1980s, there's no question that I would be assassinated. Is that assassinated? Certainly, if not assassinated, like, uh, you know, constantly harassed by this fascist state that was uh, propped up by uh, the United States. I mean, there, there was like, it, it was a... death and torture and jailing and beatings and, and, and murder in the air for anyone who dissented at all from that fascist line. And it was all made possible by the United States government. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, a lot of a lot of folks, uh, Salvadorans can can tell you, um, you know, what what that environment of of terror and repression was like. There's a reason that, um, you know, even the most sort of civic minded democratic reformers had to either go underground, uh, flee the country, join an insurgency or or they were killed. Um, there's actually uh, Stuart Schrader in his book uh, mentions that in Guatemala, you know, USAID had this program of training uh, sort of community leaders to be some kind of, you know, democratic advocates for um, for their for their communities, uh, most of whom had been murdered by the Guatemalan uh, security forces by the end of the conflict. Um, and I think especially for university students, for labor organizers, but also just for, uh, you know, subsistence farmers in rural communities, um, it's hard to overstate um, the, that environment of, of terror and repression. I mean, the, the notion among the governing elites themselves was basically that in order to suppress these insurgencies, uh, they'd have to kill most of the population. Uh, you know, they called it draining the sea to kill the fish because the insurgents were the fish in the ocean of the population. Um, so the implications of that are indeed genocidal. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Can you talk about the role of the church that you mentioned? Uh, I mean, to me, this is a particularly fascinating part of that history. You wrote a great review uh, of a book called A Radical Faith for Jacobin a couple of years ago that was telling the story of one of those nuns who was raped and murdered in El Salvador after having lived in Nicaragua for a number of years. And uh, she was an American nun uh, who through her, you know, she, she was a sort of, uh, I think it's, uh, it would probably be described as sort of like a good Catholic girl growing up in a sort of outer borough, New York, and then went to a convent and then uh, became really swept up in what, what was going on, what was, what was you know, being the transformations of, uh, of the region. And, uh, you know, she was an American who, who went to El Salvador, but it was Central Americans themselves who through the church were getting organized uh, to really uh, be, you know, creating base communities that were the some of the kind of foot soldiers for uh, these revolutions. So but both in, in the U.S. and uh, in Central America, talk a little bit more about the role of the, the church. Sure. Um, it, well, it's a really interesting history because um, there's this whole struggle that happens within the Catholic Church um, to sort of democratize uh, the the, the religion and, and the institutions, you know, to, to say mass in, in the local languages, but also to sort of like bring these teachings of Jesus um, to address this, the material injustices. Um, 
that uh, clergy, you know, and missionaries were were encountering in the communities that they worked in every day, especially in Latin America. So, you know, there's the the Council of Vatican II, and then I think really importantly, uh, the con there's a conference in Medellin in Colombia in 1968 that kind of establishes this doctrine of liberation theology um, and what's known as a preferential option for the poor. Um, and that becomes, um, I think, a, a really important framework from which a lot of religious folks get radicalized. Um, so, you know, you mentioned uh, in, in Eileen Markey's great biography of Maura Clark, um, you can see that under, under uh, programs like counterinsurgency programs like the Alliance for Progress under Kennedy, a whole bunch of uh, US missionaries get shipped off to Latin America to sort of do the work of empire. But you know, once they, they, they face these conditions of extreme inequality and they see the repression um, and that the, the communities that they're working in are, are facing, and a lot of them become radicalized. Uh, and as li the liberation theology doctrine sort of comes into being and you have uh, this whole new framework, you know, to sort of understand the teachings of Christ, you know, um, through through the poor uh, and working for the poor um, and creating, uh, I think, you know, like the kingdom of heaven on earth, um, fighting for justice. Uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of these folks end up uh, on the wrong side of these repressive US backed regimes. And there was a slogan in El Salvador um, that was uh, something to the effect of be a patriot, kill a priest. Um, and a total sort of equation of, um, of Catholicism with communism because of this trend. And that's, you know, that's why you see the assassination of uh, you know, even nonviolent, um, you know, radical intellectuals like the Jesuit priests at the UCA in El Salvador, um, but also a ton of other, you know, nuns and, and local clergy across the region. Um, it's And it's an interesting legacy as well, because, you know, today, um, evangelical Protestantism, you know, Pentecostals and the like, are, are huge in Central America. Um, around 50% of, of the, you know, population identifies as evangelicals today and not, and not uh, as Catholics, especially like in El Salvador, at least. Um, and that is its own uh, imperial legacy because part of Reagan's new right coalition was allying itself with like Pat Robertson uh, and these TV uh, evangelists, you know, to fundraise for the contrast, but also to send their evangelical warriors uh, into Central America to evangelize. Um, and we, you know, you can see the legacies of that today as well. Can you uh, talk about some of the people in the uh, the U.S. personnel who played key roles in all of this in in Iran Contra, in uh, policy in El Salvador, and through the rest of the region? The 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 ghouls of that era who are still with us today because their names keep popping up. I mean, the '80s. You know, that was less than four decades ago. A lot of those people still have uh, careers in, in public service uh, in, in which, you know, there, there have been no real consequences for anybody who's carried out any of this kind of genocidal level violence against Central Americans. And they're, they're still, you know, uh, uh, fetid around uh, D.C. policy circles today. That's right. I mean, I think... I think one of the best examples is somebody like Elliot Abrams. I think the closest thing to real consequences that he's seen after being, you know, convicted of lying to Congress was uh, Ilhan Omar's interrogation of him recently. Uh, Abrams was something like Western Hemisphere State Department head um, under Reagan. I, I'd have to look at his exact title, um, but he was a big part of covering up crimes like the Mossote massacre. Um, and the Iran Contra stuff, um, and he has gone on to oversee um, the efforts at regime change in Venezuela. Um, and I, I heard recently that he's actually been tapped to start doing the same thing in Iran. Um, so that I think that says a lot. You know, even somebody like Oliver North was just recently the president of the NRA. Um, you know, but I think. I think beyond just those individual figures, it's important to sort of emphasize the the institutional patterns that they've created, you know, and and the ideology and the practices 
that they've managed to really embed uh, in U.S. empire. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, you know, especially the sort of uh, flippant disregard, you know, for congressional oversight or, or, or legality, the constitution, you know, at any inconvenience, it's like immediately um, this kind of like paramilitary covert unilateral action um, is sort of the go-to thing. Um, but also this, this uh, notion of, of US uh, economic power as sort of, and, and, poli and political military uh, power as some kind of moral good um, that, that you know, can just continuously justify itself. Um, so it's it's interesting because that kind of like high ideology of Reagan's neocons comes up against something like Trump, um, who doesn't really appear to believe much of that, um, which is I think why you see chaos within within the right today. But. Yeah. Uh, the sports leader asks, what have been the long-term effects of these interventions? Uh, maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago. I mean, it, we're still in the midst of a really serious uh, crisis at the uh, border of Central Americans trying to flee uh, really rampant violence in the region. Can you talk about the legacy of, uh, you know, like in a country like El Salvador, how U.S. intervention led to this crisis that we still have today? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for one thing, most of the massive migration that we've seen from Central America um, has been in the post-war period. You know, there was a ton of, of you know, refugees and folks fleeing uh, to the United States during the war, but those numbers were actually um, a lot greater in the 90s and, the so and, and, and especially in the 2000s, you know, in the so-called period of, of peace. Um, because the implementation of things like the Central American Free Trade Agreement, you know, the, the massive privatization and deregulation that was imposed on these uh, on these economies um, to transition them from being, uh, you know, these sort of like natural resource colonies um, into being, uh, you know, maquiladora sweatshop. Uh, economies and exporters of, of cheap labor directly to the United States, right, in the form of migration. It was just devastating. Um, so, so, you know, a ton of people, uh, they lost their jobs, they lost their livelihoods, um, and, and came to the United States to seek work. But of course, what we've also, you know, been hearing a lot about lately is the effect of gang violence and organized crime in Central America, um, spurring forced migration and, and folks seeking asylum in the United States. And that history is also directly linked to the U.S. military intervention in the 80s, because a lot of the uh, refugees of the Civil War uh, either grew up, you know, if they came young or their children grew up in working class um, neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods, especially like in, in Los Angeles, where um, they uh, adopted uh, U.S. gang culture, you know, from U.S. prisons and, and U.S. streets. Um, and in the face of really repressive, zero tolerance, anti-gang policing in the 90s, a lot of these folks were deported back to El Salvador, um, which is where you see the, the sort of explosion of these uh, structures of organized crime. Um, so there are these vicious cycles, you know, of, of violence and, and trauma that are constantly being aggravated by U.S. intervention because, of course, the response to this is to adopt the same U.S. style zero tolerance policing that caused these folks to be deported in the first place, adopt them on the ground in El Salvador and start and, and the rest of the, the region and start building up you know, these, the, the carceral state. El Salvador today is has the second highest uh, rate of in, incarceration of its population uh, in the world next to the United States. Um, so yeah, so you can really see the consequences of these this ongoing intervention um, going way back. Uh, somebody asked about you know, we've been talking mostly about uh, U.S. hard power during this uh, discussion, uh, you know, military mm -hmm. support, military training and actual munitions and all the rest of it. But uh, what about the role of U.S. soft power in the region? I mean, maybe during the 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 height of, of U.S. intervention in the 80s, but also since then, what does U.S. soft power look like there? Mm 
Sure. I mean, I think uh, one of the the biggest and most important uh, instances, I guess, manifestations of U.S. soft power in the region is really piloted in the 1954 coup in Guatemala. There's this huge, um, it's, it's a mix of hard and soft power, but there's this huge like psychological warfare that was implemented as part of that uh, as part of that process that you see ongoing. Um, but I think you know. U.S. power in the region is exercised through sort of a continuum, you know, of consent and coercion. That's hegemony. Um, conditioning of aid, either through, you know, IMF loans or just U.S. Uh, so-called development aid or security aid, uh, is used to uh, impose all kinds of policies, be it, you know, austerity or privatization or sort of twist political arms. Um, there's also been massive U.S. funding um, of, of like, you know, labor unions, right, through the AFL-CIO famously earlier last century, um, and uh, other civil society organizations to uh, sort of advocate for, you know, market-friendly um, policies um, and programs. Uh, so I think I think there's a lot of ways in which the the U.S. exercises its uh, its power over Central American governments, um, and I think uh, a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it is sort of phrased in in the benign language of development, you know, prosperity, security, growth. But if you look at anything, um, any of of the aid packages to Central America recently. Um, they're, those, uh, they're often conditioned on a series of, you know, uh, neoliberal policies and programs that end up sort of locking these countries into the kind of dependency that I mentioned earlier. Getting a lot of great questions in here at the end that I'll try to squeeze in as many as possible. You have a comment from Autumn Leaves. Hillary has the most wholesome last name of all time. Makes me want to change my name to something like nice guy, big hugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you were mentioning soft power and uh, the role of uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned the American labor movement, which uh, kind of brings us up to the, uh, can bring us up to the current day situation because we just published an article last week in Jacobin by Tim Gill, a sociologist, uh, that was based on documents that he had received from a Freedom of Information Act request that showed that the AFL-CIO had been uh, supporting the, uh, some of the, uh, labor movement forces in Venezuela uh, that were attempting to uh, overthrow the, uh, the Venezuelan government. And uh, obviously that did not succeed. Uh, but I mean, that was a particularly eye-opening story to me because the AFL-CIO, which, you know, should be the home of, uh, you know, the working class progressive politics in this country, but because of the Cold War legacy has uh, often throughout the 20th century, especially not lived up to that. Uh, but then in 1995, there was this change of leadership. And we thought the Cold War days were behind us. And yet we still get these documents that, that reveal uh, this kind of uh, soft power uh, being you know, used in, in, not, in not just Central America, but throughout Latin America. So uh, can you talk about some, you know, th this conversation has been about Central America, but can you expand it to talk about Latin America and some of the more recent interventions like uh, attempts to uh, overthrow uh, various Venezuelan uh, leaders or uh, obviously uh, the recent Bolivian coup uh, that is, that is, you know, still, and we still have the uh, the coup installed uh, president as the head of the of the Bolivian government, and is not uh, looking like she wants to is too eager to call for democratic elections anytime soon. So, how do we, you know, are, are these things tied uh, together? And 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 can you just re reflect on what's been going on in the last couple of years in, in Latin America? Yeah. Um... You know, I was just talking with Roberto Lovato um, about his new memoir uh, for a piece I'm writing. And one of the things that he brought up uh, that he had researched a while back looking at uh, U.S. destabilization uh, in South America, especially, is the use of the Justice Department uh, now to do some of what the CIA used to do. Um, so there are these Justice Department training programs for judges uh, and for prosecutors uh, where just like they do with the police and just like they do with the military, they bring, uh, you know, young lawyers up 
to the United States for training. Uh, and one of the, the stars of this, uh, these kinds of programs is Sergio Moro, who was the uh, famous prosecutor in Brazil who led the so-called anti-corruption crusade uh, against President Lula um, and you know, you know, actively worked to prevent uh, his reelection, um, well, his candidacy uh, by throwing him in jail. Um, so that that kind of stuff goes on all the time. Um, and like he said, uh, you know, Venezuela is, you know, you can see you can see some more di direct uh, covert, you know, military action taking place. But um, Honduras is a great example as well. You know, the 2009 coup that the the under Barack Obama, the Clinton State Department helped kind of smooth over. Um, that was all justified in this language of of democracy uh, and fighting corruption. You know, they they claimed the right wing and the you know allied U.S. groups all claimed that the democratically elected president Zelaya was trying to reform the constitution to allow for his reelection, which was not the case. And so he was deposed. He was flown out of the country by the military in his pajamas, and they they stopped over, I think, to refuel at a U.S. military base on their way out of the country. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, the Honduran president of, of the post-coup regime, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who's deeply, deeply implicated uh, in narco trafficking himself, um, he reformed the constitution to uh, allow for his own reelection and nobody said a word. Um, so I think, I think that says a lot about, uh, about how, how the, that kind of thing goes down. In the uh, in the twentieth century, one of the real highlights of international American international solidarity from the left is uh, the Abraham Lincoln Brigades fighting in Spain during the Civil War against the fascists there. Uh, and Kenneth Vogel asks if there was anything like that in Central America in the 1980s. He asks about, you know, foreign volunteers going to help the Sandinistas, uh, but also, I guess you could expand it to other countries, Guatemala, El Salvador. Was there anything like that, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, American solidarity going to the front lines of these uh, conflicts in, in solidarity with these leftist movements that were under assault by U.S.-backed governments? Well, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. The the kind of stuff I mentioned under the solidarity movement, you know, there were there were these delegations inspired by things like the Manceremos brigades that indeed went traveled uh, directly to to Sandinista Nicaragua and FMLN territory in El Salvador um, to provide you know whatever kind of uh, support that they could. But you know, there were people. There were a lot of North Americans who who did uh, fight. You know, they engaged in combat. I think, you know, the the more prudent guerrilla organizations tried to sort of find uh, maybe more strategic roles, you know, for U.S. or North American allies, um, because it was sometimes more useful to have um, often white faces, um, you know, for of the movement help. Um, and in, in in other roles rather than just uh, getting shot at in the front lines, but people fought and died. Um, I don't know of anything similar to to a brigade of, of that sort, um, but you can definitely find um, examples of individuals who who went down and engaged in combat, and, and many of whom, or at least some of whom, still live in Central America today. In Nicaragua, there was Ben Linder, right, who, as far as I know, is not on the front lines. Maybe I'm wrong, but was very involved in trying to do basic infrastructure building in Nicaragua to support the Sandinista government and was killed there. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the religious folks, I think, played that same role. You know, somebody like Maura Clark, um, who we mentioned, uh, one of the nuns that was murdered in El Salvador in 1980, um, I, I think you could see what she did in the same way because she went down uh, and was sort of radicalized living in Nicaragua, ended up totally supporting the Sandinista uh, revolution and made the choice to go to El Salvador to serve after they had assassinated Monsignor Romero, knowing full well the kind of violence that she would very likely face there. Uh, and she went anyway. So I think that's a, a pretty inspiring, uh, you know, internationalist legacy. You know, as you've been speaking, I've 
been reminded that nearly every topic that we brought up, you have written a Jacobin article about. So people should go check out your author page on the Jacobin website, uh, because whether it's uh, on the role of the uh, Catholic Church in in all of in Central America or uh, the history of the uh, the sanctuary movement in the United States for Central American refugees. Uh, you've written about uh, basically all of this for us. And one other thing that you've written for us about uh, was uh, about Bernie Sanders when he, during his campaign when he was under attack uh, for his record, especially when he was mayor in uh, Burlington in standing with uh, Central Americans against U.S. intervention. And when I learned about that history, I always found that Incredible, not just because the uh, the U.S. solidarity movement with Central America is so such an amazing example of international solidarity, but that Sanders figured out a way to use his position as a mayor. Who, who's ever heard of a mayor of a town or city uh, using their position to do things like have teach-ins about U.S. backed Salvadoran government and and how it's murdering trade unionists and and you know leftists uh, in city hall. I mean, this this is kind of an, uh, an incredible use of his uh, position uh, uh, to to do international solidarity. And during his campaign for president, he uh, was you know offering a vision of what. A uh, you know a humane uh, immigration policy uh, coupled with you know internationalist uh, commitments uh, could look like and and you know effort to scale back the U.S. Uh, imperial machine in, in regions like uh, Central America. So um, can you talk a little bit about what good left uh, international solidarity, whether it's through elected officials like Bernie or for those of us who most of us who don't have hold elected office, what does good left internationalism look like today? Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's a pretty big difference between what that looks like at a policy level and what it looks like, uh, you know, at the grassroots level, at a policy level, I think it looks a lot like uh, ending, uh, you know, security aid to uh, to these, uh, you know, corrupt and repressive militaries. It looks like ending sanctions, economic sanctions, uh, ending these regime change uh, programs and um, stop you know, ending the conditioning of, of so-called development aid. Um, and I think uh, at the at the grassroots level, you know, I think we can learn a lot from the solidarity movement, you know, from its successes and from its mistakes. Um, there are a lot of young people of color and Central Americans in particular who lead uh, uh, the, organizations like SOA Watch and uh, CISPIS, the Committee of Solidarity with the people of El Salvador today. Um, and I think that's that's great. That's really important. Um, one of the, the most important things I think that we can take from the, the movements against US imperialism from that time in the US is the, the way that they were able to link um, the mass forced migration of refugees uh, from the region to U.S. intervention, you know, and you know, both defend the the rights um, of migrants and and of course their right to stay home um, if they so choose, uh, and and link that to U.S. intervention, you know, and the fight for self determination and national liberation. Um, so I think I think that that's a really important element as well. Final question. Uh, we have talked throughout this conversation about the role of the CIA in places like Nicaragua in the 80s. And obviously, since Trump's election in 2016, the CIA has be getting, given a kind of, been given a kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a boost in its uh, reputation because they're supposedly sort of standing against the worst of of Trump, but uh, knowing this history and knowing what the CIA did in, in Nicaragua and throughout the region and throughout the entire world, over the, especially over the 20th century, but also still today, how do you feel when you see that stuff about the sort of like noble CIA standing against the depredations of Trump? I mean, that stuff is like QAnon for liberals. You know, <laughs> it's, it's insane. I, you know, the any any cursory glance at CIA actions in the region uh, shows that they're essentially, uh, you know, just doing doing crimes. Um, 
And I think any kind of yeah rehabilitation of, of the FBI or the CIA just shows um, a fundamental blindness uh, to history that will be to the detriment of us all. Well, as we'd like to say uh, at Jacobin, the CIA is not your friend. The FBI is not your friend, uh, but uh, Hillary Goodfriend is your friend. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. I had to do it. I set myself up. <laughs> Well, Hillary, thank you uh, so much uh, for uh, giving us this uh, this talk. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, folks should go read her many articles that she's written at Jacobin over the years uh, about uh, Central America and Latin America. Uh, they all they're all uh, ex excellent. Um, and you know, it's a real you, you, what, what you write for Jacobin has a real um, insight into how we as leftists should be uh, going about being internationalists that, uh, you know, we can't, you know, as, much, as exciting as it is to see a reborn domestic socialist movement in this country, a really central part of that socialist movement in the United States has to be uh, solidarity uh, with other uh, countries around the world, especially that are under the uh, the boot of uh, U.S. imperialism, and your writings are really speak to uh, how we can go about uh, doing that. So, uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Hillary. Again on uh, Wednesday, uh, we have a, a discussion on why Jordan Peterson is always wrong with uh, Ben Burgess and Matt McManus. And on Friday, uh, we will be going over why you should be a Marxist uh, with Paul Heidemann. And then on the weekends, we have our weekend show uh, with Anna Kasparian and Nando Vila, joined by Lee Phillips. So please do tune in and uh, thank you all for watching. Bye.